get up and start my day I always have the best intentions Never go astray But sometimes I can't help myself You can call it a character flaw A tight pair of jeans and no spiked high heels It's the best thing I ever saw And like that ain't sufficient If she's got that fire red hair. Oh, the wind is warm, Tomma. I am the first man and a cowboy. And I am the first woman and a Viking. On the Cowboy and the Viking Show, and we are in Butte, Montana, with Lisa. Lisa, thank you very much for being on the show. I'm so nice. It's so good to meet you. Yes, yeah. and you guys are traveling through. Yeah, we are. Uh, we're at the Butte Copper Company, and Lisa's going to tell us a little bit about the history of Butte, Montana, which is known as the richest hill on earth. Yes, we are. We were the richest hill on earth. We were actually considered a little Chicago in the early 1900s because of how busy we were with the copper mine, and many people traveled. We had I mean, if you go to Uptown Butte and things like that, we still have, um, since we're the largest historical district, we actually had the longest running brothel, which closed down in the 80s, 1980s. It still stands today. Um, and then that there's a whole area of town that's called, it was called Venus Alley. And up there was parlor houses, brothels, things like that. And they had little tunnels that would actually, the the well-known wealthier men that did not want to be known of coming in and out of those they were actually allowed through tunnels through the back way from uptown into these brothels and each brothel well the Dumas anyways has different levels and each level the bottom level the basement of course was for the poorer people you know the miners and stuff who didn't have a lot of money then your next floor was where the madam's room and things were and um, and every level went up in class and like I said, the longest run running brothel, like 1980s, is when it closed down. Um, Charlie Chaplin was known to, he loved to come to Butte because he loved the women in the brothels because of the color of their skin. I mean, so much history. Evil Knievel came from Butte, Montana. His jail cell is still available on tours uptown. They still have that. Um, and then this piece, this is called our Copper Giant. This was the last piece of copper that came out of the Anaconda smelter in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So this popped out. It is heavy. It is solid copper. It's amazing. And what's nice when we say rub the copper for luck, copper is actually, a, it's an antimicrobial. So what it does is it, kill, it helps sanitize. Mm -hmm. So when I, most people, you know, with COVID and stuff, they don't want to be touching things, but it's okay to touch this because you cause a little bit of friction on the copper and it breaks through the cell of the virus and kills the virus. Well, I got but no yes, problem touching it. I know, powder. right? It's so big. But it's funny because I'm born and raised here. I've moved a couple of times and come home to Butte. We are such an amazing community. My grandfather, um, many of his friends, I remember my grandfather was a boiler maker up mm -hmm. at the pit. And I remember being a little girl in my little rabbit fur jacket and I would go to the union meetings with him. And mm -hmm. I mean, it, unions huge, everything yeah. else. Um, go to the union meetings with him. I'd even at that time you were able to go sit in a bar with your grandfather <laughs> after the union meetings and have a drink. Um, and then too, also what they started doing as started changing all the historical buildings and digging up things. They started finding speakeasies, the old speakeasies that were ran during Prohibition in Butte. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them you could still tour through today. But it's funny because they'd tear up sidewalks, they'd find a door. There would be a door 
it wasn't the speakeasy because you actually had to enter through the business and then the speakeasy was very hidden right. in the area. Right. Yeah, but I mean a lot of people, Butte's not going to go with Prohibition. We're still not going to do that to this day. <laughs> <laughs> we have and so many ethnicities. I'm actually um, a French Canadian native. My ancestors moved from Canada, my tribe did, down to Montana and then my grandfather established us here. And so we've been here. My cousin's a boiler maker to this day. Um, I have many friends that still work up at the mine, mm -hmm. Berkeley Pit, um, to this day. They don't mine as much copper as they used to, but just an amazing town and spirit. So that big piece of copper, our copper giant, what you've seen, this here is what's called covalite. Some people will call it peacock copper because of the colors. There's blues, there's violets. Um, it's a beautiful rock, but it's actually cobalite, and these were found in the Butte Mines between 1960 and 1980s. This, well, these pieces are, but cobalite is actually what is starts out before it's smelted down into copper. No longer can these pieces be pulled out of the mine. Um, they don't find it anymore. Like I said, the last ones were in the 80s is when they pulled all these pieces out. So a ton of historical um, value. These are all of our copper pieces. These are actually, these are smelted copper from our mine that come out. Copper was huge. Like we were known as Little Chicago in the early 1900s because of, we had escalators back then. We had big shopping buildings. I mean, it's just crazy with this mine and the people who traveled to us. Um, made us a lot of money. To this day, Sullivan's are a big name here. A lot of Irish are here in Butte. Um, a lot of Irish miners. We also have, we um, have Home of the Pasties. Now pasties are, what they are is they're usually hamburger or steak and they're cut up into pieces with potatoes and onions and they're wrapped in pastry shell and baked. So those were amazing for the miners to take for lunch because you didn't have to heat them up. They, they were okay, you know, when they were down in the ground working, things mm -hmm. like that. So if you ever come to Butte, get a pasty, stop down at the copper shop, check out all of our copper. Mm -hmm. and It's so amazing, mm -hmm. actually, to see you guys that travel through and just the history. Yeah, definitely. You come to Butte, you want to come to the Butte Copper Company because this is an awesome story. And I'm awesome filled with a lot too. of history stories. Yeah, <laughs> I might not know the too. dates, but yes, I know my um, evil Knievels from Butte, Montana. Um, we were discussing, you guys are down in Nashville, so we were mm -hmm. discussing a good friend of mine, um, Tim Montana, he's from Butte, Butte boy, born and raised, and I mean, just great people here, and we have such a history. Majority of us have grown up here, our families worked in the mine, we've, um, we've all grown up together. To, it's a small town, lots of love, lots of history. You go uptown, like you can take the tours and stuff uptown and you would not believe the history that you can learn. That's how I've learned so much about you, is just Ooh, listening to a lot of my elders and older people and the people that have worked in the mines. And yeah, and even, like I said, being little, going to the union meetings with my grandfather who was a boiler maker. Um, there's a bank uptown, it was called the Old Metals Bank. And it, I remember walking into that bank with my grandfather mm. when I was little and it was gorgeous because it was all marble, uh, like in a big safe in the back. And um, with the remodel of a lot of those buildings, how they're updating them, they have found not only the speakeasies, but they have found like secret rooms that even aren't on the blueprints of the buildings. There is a building uptown, I can't remember which one it was, but you walk up the staircase, and as you walk up the staircase in the corner, it looks like there's a set of stairs that should go to something, but it doesn't until they took down those walls and they realized that it went into a room probably for yeah. your wealthy gentlemen yeah. who like to entertain and so they would entertain there but it was you had to have secret passwords um, you weren't allowed, you know, really there was just, just um, during rally. prohibition, okay, like very, yeah, like they said, no, it wasn't going to stand for no alcohol. We had a ton of Irish and a lot of Indians in this place. <laughs> So of course being from Butte, you know, we love copper. Copper is our staple. I wear a lot of my copper. Not only does it make you feel good and energize your body, copper does, but it's also amazing. We have a lot of our copper products. They're solid copper. That's what I recommend. Um, 
they're made here in the U.S. with our copper. Um, we send them out, but this is pure copper. It's a drinking bottle, and one of the things of the benefits of drinking water out of copper is that it it's an antimicrobial. So what it does is it cleanses the water, gets the bad bacteria out of it, and it also energizes the water. So it helps with inflammation, arthritis, weight loss, headaches, tiredness. I remember growing up on the ranches um, on the reservation and seeing a lot of those old cowboys who wore the copper bracelets. Always, always. I never had any idea why they wore the copper bracelets until I got older. And it was for their arthritis. They never took it off. We sell those still today. It's amazing to see the younger generation finally realizing that the older ones did know what they were talking about. And it's simple. Um, then we have, I've got to show you this because I honestly did not know what this was. But my grandmother was a woman who made everything from scratch jams, pies, everything. So this is a solid copper jam pan. And what's nice about this, a lot of people use it for decoration now, but when you make jam, it's kind of like, it's very, how do I say it? I don't know, but it's hard to do. But this keeps the heat and everything, it makes it so you don't burn it. But these are jam pans, and these are all things that we carry here at the Copper Company that we get made especially for us that you can purchase online. Um, or come into the stores. These wonderful people have come in to see us. So Butte has a huge history of copper. We still do to this day. We have the Berkeley Pit Uptown, which is it's still a running mine. I have many friends that work up there. Um, but just the history of Butte and where I come from and get to share it with all these many people who travel through with me. Well, thank you again for being on the show, Lisa. Yes, thank you. We really appreciate everything you've shown us and all the history, too. I love to share my history with you guys. Yes, absolutely and love it. You keep watching the Cowboy and the Viking show and wait till you see where we're going next. Where are we going next? I'm not telling you. What? All right, the Cowboy and the Viking. Woo! <laughs>
This began to attract people from the region and many countries to take part in the hunt for gold and silver. From 1880 through 2005, the mines in Butte produce more than 9.5 million metric tons of copper, or 9.5 billion kilo. The ore mined from the Butte Mining District in 1910 alone totaled 129 million kilo of copper, 280,000 kilo of silver, and over a thousand kilo of gold. These together earn Butte the name, the richest hill on earth. In 1917, there was a disaster at the Speculator Mine. One hundred and sixty-eight people died in what was, and is, the worst hard rock mining disaster in world history. In 1881, Marcus Daly bought a small mine named the Anaconda. He was a part owner, manager, and engineer of the Alice Mine, a silver mine in one of the suburbs of Butte. Daly was given permission to inspect the surrounding areas and tried to have the Alice Mine's owner buy it, but they refused. So Daly sold his interest in the Alice Mine and bought the Anaconda Mine himself. While other mines in the area played out then closed, Daly bought up the closed mines and he eventually owned all the mines on Butte Hill. The number of Norwegians grew enough in Butte that there was a Norwegian society. There was also a Norwegian knitting club and the Norwegian Brotherhood, as well as a Norwegian newspaper for the entire region. Many Norwegians came to Butte to work in the mines and build a life there. With them, they brought Norwegian traditions, like the Norwegian Buna, a beautiful, traditional national festival costume dress in Norway, and Norwegian Lessa, indigenous to Scandinavia, which became one of Montana's symbolic foods and can still be found in stores in and around Butte today. The Norwegians brought their traditions, music, and their hard work ethic with them to do the dangerous work in the mines of Butte. Some lost their lives in mining accidents, and others prospered. People wrote home to their families in Norway, telling of their life in America, making a good living mining in the richest hill in the world, with their families back in Norway, waiting for a word from their loved ones. Many received letters telling their family they were doing well, or coming home, or sending for them to join them in America. But one person never made it back to Norway. On a Thursday afternoon on May 25, 1911, Arna Selset went to work at the rarest tramway mine, just as he had done each day. But on this day, they were blasting in one of the tunnels. Selset was in a tunnel in the mine where they were doing the blasting. Those in charge of the blasting told Selset and others there were seven holes to be blasted. After the first five went off, Selset and several other miners started to run in a hurry to get to the surface. They heard shouting, Fire in the hole! alerting them there were more blasts going off, but the men ignored the warnings. When the seventh blast went off, 
Arna Selsa was just passing where the blast happened, and he was killed. Another miner who survived, Arnold Lynn, testified that Arna Selseth was a mere five feet behind him, but directly in front of the blast. Arnold Lynn also testified they thought the warning to stop was just a joke. The coroner's inquest concluded that Arna Selset died through his own carelessness. 1911 was a sad year for the Selset family. Not only did Arna die in a mining accident, but five months later his sister Ellen also died on October 28th from tuberculosis. She was 37 years old. It's hard to imagine how a mother would feel receiving a letter from America that her son had been killed. And then just five months later, learning that her daughter had also died. Anton Selset stayed in Butte as a miner for many years. He became a U.S. citizen April 3, 1943. He returned to Norway in 1960, moving back to the Selset farm, and died in 1967 at the age of 81. Peter Finnis applied for U.S. citizenship on January 30th, 1909. A few years later, he went back to Norway and married in 1916 with Emma Christine, Jorgen's daughter. Peter had seven children and had a farm in Norway. He died December 1st, 1952, in Veron, Nord Trondelag. Anton Finis continued working in the mines in Butte and married Verda Bakke, a Norwegian woman, and started a family. They had three sons. He was a miner for over 30 years and a member of the Butte Miners Union as well as a member of the Scandinavian fraternity. Anton died at the age of 51 in Butte, May 16, 1940, of silicosis from breathing in the dust particles in the mine. Jeg er den første mann, og er cowboy. Og jeg er den første kvinne, og er viking. If you or someone you know has an idea for an interesting documentary or other film project, feel free to contact the Cowboy and the Viking Show. We'll be happy to discuss it with you. And please subscribe to our channel so you get notifications of new shows, news, and events. Go ham. The long to be feeling. Yeah, I'm gonna go ham now.